Hello, good morning. Buenos dias, everyone, dear audience. Many thanks for following again our series of webinars, Aquaculture Talks. Today, we will have a very special guest, and we will talk of main constraints about aquaculture and the gut integrity. Hervé Lucien, as you well know, is my colleague and friend. He was presenting with me. And Dr. Simon Davis, or Professor Simon Davis, if I might say it, I'm delighted to present you because personally you mean a lot to me. So I'm very happy to have you on board. Uh, currently, just to talk a little bit about yourself, Simon, I know you have a lot of history behind aquaculture and a large resume, but he's now Emeritus Professor from Harper Adams University. He's also Honorary Fellow <clears throat> from the Singapore Institute of Aquaculture. He is a senior editor for the uh, uh, magazine um aquafit magazine which everybody knows everybody knows simon from there and 35 years experience behind academia and a large number of top researchers and students who's now leading the way aquaculture is being shaped on a day-to-day -day basics so thank you for being here mm -hmm. before we start um as you might know we have a question box feel free to ask questions the presentation will last for 35 minutes and then we will spend another 30 minutes uh, answering some questions. We will have a video on YouTube available. It will take about a week to get it ready, but everybody will have the access, we send the link, and also you can share the presentation for, for some of you who cannot be here and want to share the presentation with other people. Personally, I want to thank you because this is our second webinar and it's looking very good. We have a lot of our audience, a lot of attendance, and it really makes me really happy. Thank you, Jeff, for having us today, and thank you, Annie, for organizing. Simon. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Kurt. Thank you, and uh, I'm uh, greetings from Plymouth in the United Kingdom, and uh, I'm uh, based here at my home in Plymouth in the United Kingdom, and now it's time to share the screen, and I've uh, I'm going to try to just minimize myself here so I can present the uh, the screen to you without my picture there. So let me just change this and move oh, my okay. my box down a little bit so you can see the, the presentation properly. Okay, Kurt, that's very kind of you and so professional of you. Yes, 35 years in the business and a never ending, never ending story. As um, a doctor, one of my colleagues before mentioned the never ending story of aquaculture. So taking the highway to improve a gut integrity um, and function in aquaculture is, is the title. And that's based on the fact I do feel sometimes it's an expressway, like a, a mega highway of lots of side roads inputting into um, the theme today. So aquaculture, as we all know, is an expanding industry. This is uh, obvious to most of us on the webinar today. It's, there's no secret here that the challenge is to meet over 60% of farm fish production by the 2030s and we're on our road to that obviously we are seeing production exceeding that 2012 figure there is already out of date on the left hand side of that image we're well over 52 53 percent now depends on statistics and how we interpret this but we're well onto our onto our pathway our highway to reaching uh, the 62 percent target because of the increasing demand of fish and shellfish and the fact that that's even eclipsed beef consumption today is a rather sobering thought. More and more people are turning to, to seafood and fish in particular. Um, let me just change the slide here. I'm a bit, it's frozen slightly. Ah, here we go. Now then, the thing is, uh, a lot of you um, obviously are very interested in the salmon cycle. Aquaculture and in terms of the iconic value of salmon is very much at, the, at, our, our, at our interests. Salmon farming is very, very important economically, but of course aquaculture is much broader than that. But I just want to make sure that you that we do appreciate that much of our work and examples of aquaculture nutrition did originate with rainbow trout and salmon going way back into the 1940s and 50s. We know a lot about the nutrition of farmed salmonids and salmon being a very iconic species. But what I want to actually obtain from this image is the complexity of the life cycle of fish. Um, we are lo we're looking at different stages of production, and this shows it very well in a very complicated manner. The salmon life cycle is a complex and it's dual phase. 
Salmon spend a lot of time in the fresh water and the seawater. So we have challenges to meet the nutrition of such fish like this. And there are many, many other species of fish that, of course, inhabit freshwater, marine environment and brackish. So the pressures of the environment and the challenges of the environment are going to be different for different species. I am particularly interested in, in uh, salmonids. I've done a lot of my work and background in salmonid aquaculture. And there's the, the proof of the pudding is the fact that I'm a uh, I'm picture of me, one of the fish farms nearby in Somerset, looking at these, these fry. And we have to look at the brood stock and the production of fry and the grow out stages to meet the demands of healthy farm fish. So take, take comfort from the fact that we are not going to uh, neglect the, the salmon industry and we have to cater for many, many of the challenges. Although um, we must remember that we put fish under various different types of environmental stresses in terms of culture, methodology, protocols, and tilapia is a very important fish for me. I've done quite a lot of work on tilapia and the stocking densities of these fish vary enormously. The conditions of the environment, temperature tolerance, all those factors will put demands on the requirements to meet their nutrition and the efficacy of production. I've picked tilapia because of course, it's a very important species. It's well known to many people and it represents in terms of volume and carp. I haven't mentioned carp in terms of a slide, but we must not neglect the fact that much of our aquaculture demand is freshwater based and um, carp makes up a very, very large percentage of that. So I don't want to neglect that, but there are many, many other species that I will not be able to mention today. And so um, please forgive me if I don't do that. High intensity shrimp farming, of course, we've got Kurt there introducing me and high intensity shrimp farming is um, very much a, a, an important component of aquaculture, bringing with it a lot of issues, a lot of quest for uh, balanced new types of feeds to meet the stocking densities that we are encountering in terms of um, polytunnels, uh, the effect of, um, of uh, different types of systems and bioflock comes into this in a big way, and that will all impact on how we approach the importance of formulating diets for the whole diversity of fish. Never in any other animal production system do we encounter such diversity, and diversity of form and diversity of function. That's something I'm always imparting to my students. But we have challenges here, which are very, very interesting that we don't see in the swine industry and the poultry industry and the ruminant industry because of the richness of the animals that we can work with. Aquaculture nutrition and feed technology, nutritional and feed ingredient challenges to fish and shrimp are at the heart of this story. That's why I've called it the gateway or highway to enteral gut related stress and malfunction. Under the circumstances of animal husbandry production, we will see malfunction. We will see a complex interaction between the animal and its environment. Combining all these factors, we must consider the nutritional and ingredients, nutritional requirements and the ingredients to formulate into aquaculture diets. So there are many key areas for aquaculture nutrition. When I give these lectures, I may want to concentrate on other issues as well. So, but I've highlighted two important areas here, but we mustn't neglect the novel feed ingredients that we're going to be evaluating in the future. We have to reevaluate our mineral sources and the bioavailability and the speciation and the organic presentation of our minerals. That's another issue. But today we're going to be looking more at assessing the functionality properties of natural feed additives, supplements in relation to gut health and physiology. Nutritional immunology, I, I nearly started out as an immunologist, not a fish uh, nutritionist. But today we are converging our sciences. We are converging our nutrition interests with immunology. And we are looking at fish welfare, stress modulation, production. And of course, there's nutrition and genetic selection for various traits, such as health and production. And all these things overlap. Ultimately, of course, nutrition and product quality, tastes and texture and color um is obviously our end point but today we're going to be concentrating on those two main areas there in the middle okay um now formulating diets used to be um uh something you could do on a calculator we can formulate to meet specific nutritional requirements and over the years the whole 
concept has oscillated from being rather fixed formulations to now we are moving back to much more flexibility in the choice of raw materials that we would use. So we have to define our nutrient levels and formula specifications to meet the requirements of fish and crustacea, um, to check out the ingredient limitations, the availability, the price, the nutritional composition, and then formulate using sophisticated software. And, and uh, many of us are familiar with the sophisticated software we would use. The challenge now is more than just meeting the nutritional requirements for growth and production, but to also meet the challenges for health. We put the health of the fish in the past, perhaps on the back burner. We didn't consider the health interests and the long-term health defense system and approach to the fish from the stresses of this environment and disease as much as we did on production. So we must get that balance readdressed. So we are all familiar with the raw material choices available over the years. We were very happy to use high levels of marine ingredients such as fish meal, fish oils. The alternate protein sources to fish meal uh, cover a wide spectrum of available raw materials. Um, I've worked with poultry meat meals, feather meals, all sorts of things, blood meals, and they've all, they've all been very, very interesting and they work extremely well, but they're not available in all countries. And due to legislation limitations, we can't use some of those animal byproducts. So there's been a long-term goal to use plant byproducts, and they're very, very successful, some very good products out there. The degree of processing that's involved is going to be highly variable. And so we have to be considering the types of processing technology that are associated with removing, unfortunately, the levels of anti-nutritional factors associated with plant ingredients. Um, soybean has been very notable in the past, but there's many other raw materials being advocated that would have their own different types of anti-nutritional factors that we have to uh, consider in our feed formulations. That's been a driver. These are drivers in the quest for um, directing better feed formulations using uh, a rather more broad spectrum of ingredients. Lately, we've seen a lot of interest in new generation of SCPs. The wheel is turning from the 1970s, 80s, back to the 2020s. Uh, many of these ingredients have been looked at before, but the price and availability has changed, so they're now back in fashion again. Various types of yeasts and bacterial, algae-based ingredients are obviously very, very topical at the moment. And without um, leaving a very important one out, the biofuel fermentation derived from distillers dry grains and yeasts is very much highlighted at the moment due to the uh, increased interest in the biorefinery industries. And um, we see a lot of byproducts coming out of that domain. And so we are very interested in looking at the functionality more of these raw materials. That's the underlying theme of this um, conversation today. Okay, and nutrition for health and production means that all these roads lead to the gut highway. The gut, the intestine of the fish, is fundamentally one of the, it's the largest organ in the animal besides the liver. It's the main highway for digestion and assimilation of nutrients. But the gut is more than that. The gut is the ultimate interstate for the fish. So we have to connect the physiology, the metabolic function to the gut. Ultimately, nutrition and uh, absor absorption of nutrients leads to growth and production and development. But the immune system is, of course, a very important part fueled by adequate nutrition. So the immune system links to metabolic function, physiology. So we have here a nice loop, a loop, a cycle of very important areas to consider. And the fish microbiome is really going to play a major role in that, as we will see later on. Now, again, um, I, I, re I recently wrote a chapter in a book uh, on medicines, nutritional diseases in uh, fish medicines and uh, health. And this was taken from, the pictures were taken from that. And uh, you see increasing problems with superficial aspects of the fish that we may not consider so much in, the, you know, in terms of the, the, the edible portion of the fish that reaches the harvest sizes. But of course, during that, during that pathway, we see nutritionally related diseases. Some of them can be very, very 
um, uh, disadvantageous to the animal, of course, if you have ventricular cataracts and, and fin erosion and skin lesions and hemorrhaging will lead to mortality and a reduced and an effective immune system. These are related to, to various nutritional issues. Some of them may be deficiencies or other aspects relating to inadequate balance. We see gut enteritis uh, due to diet. This is a, a a slide showing there on the bottom the gut, a healthy gut with long um, mucosal folds and increasing surface area compared to the image where a fish has been challenged with a soya bean meal. And we'll see that in more detail later. Also, we see problems with the gills, external integument. So the, gut, the mucosal interface is something we're going to be considering, not in just terms of the gut, but also the external um, integument of the fish and in the areas of the gills and the surface skin. An important part of the whole systemic, systemic response to diet. Um, so you see me taking a sample of mucus. The skin and gills of fish is rich in mucus producing goblet cells, providing this dynamic barrier to bacteria and other pathogens. Protozoan, metazoan parasites, viruses, fungi, and crustacean parasites such as sea lice are all going to be affected by the quality of the skin. The mucus of fish is rich in these antimicrobial peptides, complex polysaccharides, such as the mucins and immunological related proteins, as well as a surface microbiome. This is something we haven't really thought too much about in the past. So, so right, um, here is a dissection of a salmonid gut. I did this, by the way, to show that I've still got my hands nimble. And um, the typical gastrointestinal morphology of the salmonid intestinal tract, you can see here the splayed open stomach compartment, the pyloric area, and the midgut, where a lot of the absorption and dynamics of a, um, vitamin and minerals and amino acids and all the other complexities of the diet are absorbed and assimilated. And then we have this hindgut area, which is very, very important for reabsorption of nutrients and, of course, for the compaction of feces and the reabsorption of, of moisture, water, and dynamic electrolyte balance. A very important part of the gut that we perhaps in the past have underestimated its function, but is very prone to nutritional damage, as we will see in a later image. So the gut immunological function in fish, the mucosal surface of the gut secretes mucus, secretion of antimicrobial peptides. We see anti-inflammatory and pro-inflammatory action associated with the cytokines. We, we are, we are, this allows for macrophage and innate response to infection via these localized cascades of interconnecting protein messenger molecules. These elucidate in terms T lymphocyte reactions to some specific pathogens. And then of course that triggers off eventually uh, in terms of B cell humoral responses in the um, acquired immune system. So we have a complex mixture of cellular and humoral responses uh, at the gut immunological interface. And this is our gateway to vaccines and therapeutics. Okay, I hope you're all with me there. If I turn the slide now then. This is rather a frightening slide. Um, I'm indebted to colleagues in the past who have helped me Put this together and this slide uh, on the far left you see a typical um, structure associated with mammalian gut epithelial folding and on the right hand side you see something more likely what you would get in fish there's no central lacteal vessel in the velus uh, of, of fish we call them mucosal folds and we see here a whole complexity of different types of cellular responses we see there in the lumen of the gut we see there the um, the, uh, the friendly green bacteria, these are the um, commensal bacteria which are associated with the transient flow in the gut and those which anchor and stick to the, to the gut wall would be our commensal bacteria. But we have the potential for pathogen uh, invasion and if we have a breach of this system, if we have a breach of the system, then these bacteria can in elicit a, a, a cascade of immunological responses. Um, which would then allow a lot of cells to become activated. And we see this happening in uh, many animal systems. Of course, in fish, we can relate this to um, perhaps the, some of the closest um, research has been done is in poultry. We know a lot about the poultry gut. 
and its immune system, but we are learning much, much more thanks to the innovative work in universities like Aberdeen, uh, the immunological status of fish. So the immune response is involving a lot of different cells. These CDT helper cells, there's a whole variety of them which are involved in um, the gut mediated response. And um, if I just switch, okay, I hope my my, my image is not in the way there, but you can see there the, um, the, the basically complexity of the gut. Now, the regulation of this immunocompetence is very, very interesting. And this is where nutrition can modulate this effect through the microbiome. The intestinal dendrite cells can mediate antigenic presentation to the gut for the innate and specific immunity response. We see the role of the T uh, helper cells in the lymphoid tissue. This is the lymphoid tissue underneath the cell enterocyte layer, the epithelia. And they're involved in this tolerance role to try to educate, educate the gut not to respond to certain types of pathogens, but to respond to the to the to the to the invasive pathogen and not to have a tolerance to those pathogens which are going to be very important for overall gut health. So the role of the cytokines, these interleukins that we hear so much about, and these tumor necrosis factors are all very important in our in our understanding in the stimulation of the innate immunity in fish and also for the acquired immunity as well. They are released by the macrophages, the endothelial cells, and they, they, the challenge is to dampen down the pro-inflammatory events, the, the um, cytokine cascade or cytokine storms that we could get if we breach the gut and to effect an anti-inflammatory counterbalance scenario. So the orange, uh, orange interleukins there versus the blue ones, we are trying to, to balance this out correctly. So we get a much more effective and, uh, and efficient gut integrity. So the bacterial status of the intestine modulates the systemic metabolism, the bacterial profiles and the metabolomics and the proteomic dynamics are all interlocated and interrelated together. And um, we need to understand much more of this. So more and more people and researchers now are using the omics, um, the proteomics the genomics, but it's not enough to understand gene expression. We need to know more about the actual metabolites that are generated and the proteome dynamics. So the functionality of these bacteria is, of course, at the heart of our story. We need to know much, much more about this. Unfortunately, more technology is becoming available to do so. And um, hopefully we can integrate all these things together to make a much better story. So microbial balance, fish condition, pathogen, environment. If the environment is very stressful to the fish, then the fish condition will be affected. If the pathogen is there in the background, it will take hold and occupy the territory in the gut and outcompete the healthy commensal bacteria or friendly bacteria. Probiotics and prebiotics help us to perhaps balance this better. And so that's why feed additives, which are at the heart of this story, such as prebiotics and probiotics may help us to raise, raise the barriers so we don't get infection and disease. So that's a very important slide to consider. And um, this one again is a, a nice uh, display. It shows that animal life events such as development, aging and stress go back to my salmon life cycle story, where we have fish moving from one zone to the other, the stress of the environment, then we have the altered symbiosis potential of imbalance. We have the symbiosis, the, the bacteria in association with the gut gives us a symbiotic relationship. So we have this animal microbiome um, interaction through immune signaling and metabolic exchanges. So I like this slide because it really gives you a nice overview of normal environmental and animal variations that make up a very complex story indeed. Now, I've been involved recently with a lot of feed additives, ranging from, you know, a lot of work on prebiotics. Here's some very good examples of prebiotic structures. They're usually carbohydrate-based, glycans, beta-glucans, MOS, FOS, GOS, inulin. Um, there are many, many commercial companies out there making wonderful products based on these. And I don't want to name them, but I'm sure you, you all know who they are. And some of you out there would be using them, especially the, the large commercial feed companies. The probiotics, the yeast, the bacteria, the spores, or living, living or spore-like, these bacteria are, could be arrested, or they could be in a dormant state and activated later. 
The problem there is getting them into the diets and in a stable form. Immune modulation, improved gut functioning integrity is what we are looking at. Exogenous enzymes such as the proteases and xylanases and the phytase can liberate liberate the carbohydrate structures to allow the bacteria to basically digest and create um, uh, volatile fatty acids and all sorts of things like that. And I'm very, I really do like solid solid state fermentation products. SSF, that should be SSF, solid state fermentation products, which can act as assistance augmenting digestion and they can interact with the gut microbiome. Most recently, protein hydrolysis have been very much on the fashion and we've got some good data to show the evidence there of and phospholipids, emulsifiers, organic acids, acidifiers, and plant-based phytobiotics are also very important ones. And so nucleotides, which are found in the cell um, cytoplasm of yeasts and other microorganisms such as SCPs, again, um, I'm very, very interested in the functionality of these and how they might affect the gut microbiota and enhance disease resistance. So some recent work has shown the benefits of nucleotides in repairing and turning over the gut uh, because the gut is a highly dynamic organ. It's always been damaged, even in normal life, it's been damaged. Our guts are being damaged every day. So we have to you know, look at functional nutrients that can arrest and mitigate against this. And the reason I like yeasts and cell cells, the cell, yeast cell components are really um, a major component of many commercial products now, like the mannanolicosaccharides, the beta glucans, and the, the chitin, which you can find in insect material, and uh, crustacean, insect, chitin is another form of um, functional carbohydrate structure we could look at. And the cell wall of yeast is very rich in these. Um, normally beta-linked carbohydrate monomers, which are not broken down very easily in the in the gut, but can only be broken down by microorganisms. So they resist my, uh, digestion and can function very well in the hind gut area, which I mentioned earlier. So they can actually trigger off localized localized beneficial effects. Okay, and bacterial colonization, immunity, and disease is, is all about that. The specific host bacterium adhesive receptor mechanisms are unclear in fish. What are the receptors that can actually um, sense the right types of bacteria for adhesion to the gut? How is that going to be uh, looked at in the future? How can we formulate diets that can help to, to actually improve bacterial um, adhesion for probiotics, for instance? These are important for the commensal organisms in the vertebrates and fish. The fimbrial adhesive lectins on the bacteria bind the specific mucosal surface, sugar residues. So sugar is at the heart of the story of how bacteria anchor to the gut. And in um, other animal species like in pigs and poultry, we look at sialization or uh, glycosylation of these uh, structures. So we may want to look at that in the future in designing our diets and improving gut microbial interactions. So the evolution of gut development and the stage of maturity is influenced by diet. It's also influenced by the temporal effect of the animal's uh, temporal and uh, where it is in its production system, whether it's a fry or a fingerling or a, a, a grower or a broodstock fish, there will be a temporal effect on the gut microbiota as well, which we should even, which we must contemplate in designing. So pathogenesis is when the um, when we have a situation here where the farm fish and shrimp is vulnerable to ubiquitous opportunistic bacterial pathogens. Pathogens are opportunistic. They insult the system when the system is down. When the system is down, the bacteria insult the system. So stress can result in a loss of epithelial permeability and enhanced uptake of bacterial products like antigens and toxins can cause damage, leading to enteritis, infection, and poor gut quality. So the three, three or four factors interplay together. And of course, this can be very, very variable in the, in the stage of production. Now, the, the gut integrity of rainbow trout fed manoligosaccharides is a, a study I did some long time ago. This is a, a very nice slide. It's very dramatic, but it does show the effect very, very clearly. The fish fed diets high in standard quality soya bean meals 
uh, are not normally an issue. Uh, soya bean meal quality for salmonid fish and high high value species is very 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 good at the moment. Has been processed to remove many of the uh, uh, antitrustal factors and the saponins, which can cause a lot of damage in association with um, uh, cellulose and other and stachyos, raffinose, which you find in these are complex carbohydrates, non-starch polysaccharides, which can trigger off a, a enteritis in fish. So we see here a high in gut enteritis um, in a controlled diet with a an average stand, um, a soya bean meal of average quality. And you can see the effect here very dramatically. You can see with mannan and oligosaccharide, a restoration of the mucosal fold length. And if you look at it on the electronic level, at the electron microscopic level, you can see looking down there on the scanning electron micrograph on the top of the image there, you see how much better and closer and tighter structure is when um, we uh, have a mannan and oligosaccharide as an example. It's one example of a prebiotic changing the whole dynamics and structure of the gut at this uh, morphological level. And you can see on the bottom slide there, transmission electron microscope shows it end on. These are the microvilli, I should say. These are the microvilli, and you can use the word microvilli correctly for fish, but you don't call the mucosal folds villas in fish. But these are the electron microscopic images, which I think makes things look much better. The, the It's like the, the pile on a carpet on the, on the right hand side, very tight, high quality, whereas they're degraded and damaged on the on the left hand side, very noticeable. OK, and there is a much better picture of the brush border. We call it the brush border. This is the ultrastructural resolution of the microvilli. You can see the electron micrograph clearly showing the marked increase in microvilli height and more regular pattern in moss fed salmon. It's not just moss that does these things. There's many other um, attributes to other uh, functional glyco glycosidic carbohydrates, which are called prebiotics. They can do things like this as well, like inulin and FOS and, and COS, chitin oligosaccharide. But this is a good example. And MOS seems to be um, a very big favorite to be used by the industry. And um, again, a much better resolution picture here. You can see that um, on the left, a little bit more sp uh, spread out villi, microvilli, whereas they're tighter on the right-hand side. Okay, so obviously, if they're, if they're if there's more of them and there's much more resolution, and they are um, uh, basically a higher numbers of villi per surface area, then you're going to get better absorption, better nutrient absorption, better growth, and uh, that's obviously going to end up in being a superior production trait. So. Now then, just to not to leave the shrimp out, what do we know about the gut system in shrimp? Well, increasingly we see lots of problems with the hepatopancus and we know there's EMS and uh, lots of uh, white diseases like white spot and so many challenges to shrimp in the shrimp industry leading to very high mortality. The gut gill microbiome and the gut gill integrity is just as important in shrimp. And more recently we've been doing work in that direction with Kurt and uh, in Mexico and the environment and the factors of the environment, pond water quality, the microorganisms in the water, the, the, the microorganisms of the environment obviously play a major role here. And so that's going to be something we must consider when we formulate diets. How much influence can we have through diet compared to the overall the pond microorganism, or pond microbiota? And colleagues of mine in, in Exeter University are doing a very good work in that direction to look at the dynamics of the pond environment in relation to shrimp production and other fish species and fish species in general. So diet, stress, the microflora here are really of, of great importance. And I'm very interested in the role of the penaidins. These are the uh, antimicrobial type proteins and signaling proteins that you find in shrimp because shrimp do not have a an acquired immune system, they have an innate system based around the hemocyte. So we need to look more at how the diet can, can affect other types of systems other than those in fish. Um, I wouldn't like to say that the shrimp immune system is primitive, it's just different. It's different. And we need to understand that difference to put into practice. So there's a little cartoon there to liven up. 
the microbiota then plays a significant role in the development and the physiology of its host. It assists in preventing the growth of pathogenic bacteria by outcompetition. It can modulate the immune response, affecting nutrient absorption. It can regulate metabolic processes and synthesizing even vitamins. Certain, certain vitamins like B12 can be synthesized by these specific classes of microorganisms. So they play another role too in producing volatile fatty acids, VFAs, which are important in the production of uh, in, in the uh, dynamics of muscular development in the uh, in the wall of the intestine. We know that these VFAs play a big role in the ruminant nutrition story. Okay, for the for the dairy cow, for the beef cow, and so in fish, the hind gut system may play an important role there in producing these VFAs, which can contribute to energy utilization as well. So my take on this is that you'll see a lot of pictures like these are images. This is one that um, on FOSS and the role of uh, FOSS can influence the bacterial community. Now, I'm not an expert in all of these bacteria, but I know I can, I can see some bacteria there which are going to be very beneficial and would be of benefit, uh, an attribute, an attribute to the, to the fish. So here we have a fractal oligosaccharide, 0.2 to 0.8% inclusion in the diets, and you can see a drastic shift in this pattern. There are many ways of expressing this pattern, by the way, and many of you doing this bioinformatics and we can interpret the, 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 the bacteria. We can do a metagenomics approach to look at the functionality of those bacteria in much, much more detail. By just taking um, um, uh, gene, uh, uh, just a, um, a gene, uh, a gene expression approach wouldn't tell you the whole story. You've got to look at the whole spectrum of bacteria here, and that's why shotgun analysis and metagenomics is now becoming a more interesting um, aspect as technology improves, obviously. But we talk about 16S ribosomal RNA as a default. Everyone is using that as basis for the variation, the variance variant structure on the bacteria to identify the bacteria. But I'm seeing more and more scientific papers now addressing the 18S ribosomal, which is basically coding for the, the eukaryotic organisms. So we, we've been looking more at the pro, prokaryotic organisms, but not so much the eukaryotic organisms. So to make up the whole balance and picture of the gut, we should be looking at the whole complement and how they interplay. One of my major criticisms of such papers in the past has been there are the snapshots. They're snapshots, snapshots in time. They're not the whole story, and they don't integrate to give us the right information about how they work and what are the meta metabolites and the benefits to the fish. Going back to that last slide before on metabolites and metabolomics, we need to make that, that bigger connection. Okay, and um, here we see this is um, work in progress. This is fish hydrolysis. This is work from from my friend Kurt, and we can see here that we're looking at the um, gut microbiome uh, response of shrimp to the um, utilization of 0% in the control, 2% and 4% inclusion of a fish hydrolyzed from, from a tuna byproduct. And you can see there, there's, there's some um, effect on the gut microbiome, but maybe not as much as you might expect to see possibly from other people's work, but we do see a shift and there is some effect. But when we go and do the more advanced uh, proteomics and other things, we might see um, much more detail than we do the metagenomics, particularly to look at the characterization of the, uh, the not just the phyla, but the genus of the, of the various bacteria. So the gut microbiome of shrimp fed the diet with supplemented fish hydrolysis, you can see uh, there was a significant improvement in performance of these uh, animals when we included um, not 2% 2, 2 inclusion of the protein hydrolysate, okay? But this, the effect is noticeable and significant over the control. So obviously there's some benefit to the shrimp's health and we need now to find out why, okay? And this is another way we go further into it. You can see there when we do it on a much more detailed level, you can see um, some changes, some depletion of some bacteria, the richness and diversity, the richness and diversity of the bacteria will change. And you can see there that's a Venn diagram, which shows the overlap of some of these uh, strains of bacteria 
and the commonality, there's a commonality of certain bacteria which are resistant to change. And you can see the shared overlap there in that nice diagram on the on the right hand side. Okay, so I owe, owe um, Kurt um, uh, his um, uh, a favor for that. And we have been supervising Kurt to do trials like this as part of his PhD. And he's just obtained his doctorate from this work. So congratulations to him there. So this is very interesting work. And um, there we are. Um, thank you for your attention. Happy guts make happy fish. Sorry for the uh, the pun, but I think that um, uh, it's, it's true for humans, it's true for fish, it's true for any animal. So thank you very much. And I hope that that's launched you into um, questions. Sorry about the, 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 the highway approach to this. I was speeding a little bit along the highway. I hope I don't get a fine from Jeffro for that. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Ah, you're there. <laughs> Excellent talk. Thank you very much. I hope uh, that was a balanced talk. And I know that for many people in the audience, ex there's experts in the audience, people I really respect who know a lot about the microbiome in much more detail. They are working in this area, companies that are doing this. And also, but I had to take a middle ground approach to this. Indeed. We really enjoyed the talk. The matter of fact is it was very well presented. You overlap all the information from the early stages. Mm -hmm. But the most important is that the importance of the gut. As you said, yeah. it's the largest organ and involves many functions, including mm -hmm. health, performance, and, and yes. it's really a complex organ when you think about oh. it. Very complex. It's, a tend it's an endocrine organ. It produces mm. hormones. As we know, when we get an upset, before your exams, when you do an exams in school, you get upset stomach. Your hormones are there, and it's a major organ. And it's very complicated and even linked to the brain. And I didn't mention Indeed. that the gut microbiome can be linked to many of the problems, clinical nutrition, we see in humans. Simon, can you answer to the can you answer please to the question of Fernando? He asked okay. whether it is the major subject to reduce antibiotics free yes. food. It can yes. improve feed efficiency and other improvements, but need more research and approved commercial product at low prices. I so. couldn't put it better. It's a very good statement and it's a question, not a statement. I think that basically antimicrobial resistance AMR is a very big talking point, especially you know, in the many countries like the EU has put a lot of their legislation in place to ban antibiotics. And yet now this concerns because of Britain and Brexit that we may be importing animals, not just fish, but poultry, pigs, swine, um, which have been fed much more antimicrobial compounds during the course of their production to improve efficacy. So yes, I think this this approach with prebiotics, probiotics, um, will make a very big difference because we can then lower our, our thresholds. It's about lowering the thresholds. Of course, we need chemotherapeutic agents. We will always need them for acute diseases. We will need that, but we don't want to use them for routine practice. So I agree. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, another question, Simon. Um, yes. Someone, let me just say, senior scientist. Uh, okay, I don't mm -hmm. recognize the country. Uh, from Belgium, I believe. Oh, Which God. groups of microorganisms in the microbiome are regarded as positive? Can you mention well, a few? Yes, I can mention a few. I have uh, thought about that question, and let me just uh, remind. Yes, the um, there's a lot of interest in the. Uh, uh, Lactobacillus uh, area of Lactobacillus has been looked at by many people, and we see uh, that is a natural background levels in many of our um, uh, our studies. We see it uh, as part of the of the bacterial um, system. But that, uh, there's a lot of companies now producing um, the uh, strains originating from the gut. They obviously some of them are proprietary. We don't know too much details because they don't want to give up up too much of their of their detail. But I, I did make a, a list of some of them, and I'm just trying to find my notes here, but I can't seem to find. But there are, the lactobacillus is one of the top ones of interest. And um, so we are looking at many, many others by culturing those bacteria. There's a lot of interest now in looking at the natural microbiome in the gut and the environment to try to pick out the better ones. Okay. 
Okay. I have another question for you. This is a, mm -hmm. this is a pretty good one. Do you think metagenomics approach is enough to interpret the good and the bad? God help. No. I, I think the metagenomics can give you a lot of much more details, like putting the Hubble telescope onto the problem. We can get much, much more detail about the functionality of some of these other, uh, it, 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 it measures everything, you know, in ultra detail, all the subclasses of the, of the bacteria, the phyla, the genus and the subgenus, it goes into much, much more detail. And then we can make uh, links to other uh, systems where we know what those bacteria do. But as I said in my talk, um, if we don't do the proteomics to see what those proteins are being expressed and the metabolomics mm. associated with that, then we don't get the full picture. But I think metagenomics is uh, a very good approach and takes us much more steps further down the line. Okay. okay? Excellent. Yes. Okay. I know there are so many questions coming in, Simon, oh, it's a non-stop. Uh, I'm trying to pick up the, uh, the most important. Well, these are yeah. the ones I, I see. Okay. There's another one saying, he's asking, yes. Uh, with the actual trend to reduce the use of fish meal, which do yes. which you think will be the major risk in the near future? Uh, can you repeat that question, please? Yes. Uh, with the actual trend to reduce the use of fish meal, uh, yes. what, do you, what do you think will be the major risk in the near future? The major risk? Well, I think that I've used the term in the, my lectures to students that we are on a physiological knife edge. Uh, fish meal, I, I'm a big fan of fish meal. I think fish meal is a great source. It's an important, it's the platinum standard, but we have to reduce the amount of it we use because of strategic requirements and from the point of view of sustainability and impact to the environment. And I'm a believer that we have to use a mixture of, of alternative proteins. Everyone talks about insect protein at the moment and everyone talks about fish meal replacement. It's no longer viable to talk too much about fish meal replacement. We are using fish meal at, at its minimum now in many feed formulations on the ongoing uh, diets for salmon, for instance. We use we don't use fish meal hardly ever for other species, but you know where we do, but not as much. But for mm. salmon and trout, we've reduced it, and it is dangerous to talk about one ingredient as mm. being the, the the answer to everything. So soya bean will be there and plant ingredients, but we must look at SCPs and algae bacteria and insect meal as a strategic um, suite of, of alternatives, but not as one single alternative. That's the danger, is relying on one thing and uh, they're not nutritionally complete. They are not amino acid balanced correctly, mm. either one of them. They have to be balanced in the typical kind of feed formulation I showed you, you know, using the computers. To formulate well, amino acids. In fact, the fish meal is never going to go away, but it no. will come from different sources, right? Indeed. And there's, there's, what is fish meal? One of my major criticisms of scientific papers is that they don't say what type of fish meal they use in their experiments. Is it a low temperature know. fish meal? LT. Um, is it a fish meal from, uh, from Peru? Is it a Peruvian fish meal, Chilean fish meal? Is it uh, uh, from Iceland, Icelandic fish? You've got Menhaden, you've got anchovy, you've got such different types, different seasons, different, different parts of the world. That's highly variable. And that's yeah. why these companies will use a blend and they, they are very astute to this. They know what they're doing. Mm. They know what they're doing. Okay. Well, we mm -hmm. have not only, not only questions, but also comments. Very positive, oh. I have to say. Somebody mm -hmm. said, a very gutty presentation. <laughs> a very what? Gutsy. A very gutty. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like maybe that. I need an indigestion tablet for my gut after that. Okay. So, Yes, but a gutsy, a gutsy presentation. Well, it was, it was meant to be, really. It's meant to bring it okay. all together to point towards the gut. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Hi, Dr. Simon. What mm. are your thoughts on BioFlock as a nutritional supplement? Is BioFlock right. agriculture a proven method to increase fish immunity and growth? Yes. Yes. Now, there's interesting work being done recently in Mexico and other uh, Latin America on using stable isotopes. By using a stable isotope, these are not radioactive, by the way, but they're naturally found. Stable isotopes in the bioflock will be different to the diet's formulation. So we can now tell how much of the diet is being retained in the growth of the shrimp and other fish and species like fish, as well as the background effect of the bioflock. So in tilapia, they use bioflock in, as we know, in, in 
Mexico when we visited last year. So the bioflock will definitely play a role in providing mm. vitamins and availability of certain classes of vitamins produced by some of the organisms within the bioflock to stabilize the gut and provide a more stable platform, a film within the gut uh, to allow certain other bacteria to function. But I think the diet, the diet will play obviously um, a big effect. I've had this argument with various people who would say that the bioflock does a negligible role. I don't think that's accurate. The papers I've read in the Journal of the World Aquaculture Society point to the bioflock providing a good background level of um, certain types of nutrition. Okay, Indeed. not everything. I've seen it at the farm. We use all the time with nurseries. Yeah. Mm. It becomes very positive, I have to say. Yes, it's the bioflock quality itself. Yeah. The bioflock is a very good stabilizer. Okay, provides some nutrient background nutrients, but it's also st a stable environment. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's a question of uh, Mr. Shok Ting Tan. How Ooh. those fish, how those fish, I do said, play a role in modulating the gut microbiome in a right. deep acid? Good question. Very good question. It's actually down to the to the to the composition of the hydrolysis. How far do you make a hydrolysis? Do you take the hydrolysis all the way down to small peptides and maybe amino acids, a single amino acid basis. No, that's not good enough. You will have a pattern. You will take the hydrolysate to a certain level where you have a molecular, a molecular picture, a molecular profile of different classes of protein structures where they range from uh, polypeptides, uh, small peptides, but they will be basically functional. They'll have to retain some functionality to this, okay? Some, some type of antigenicity as well to trigger off an immune response and you have to have the protein shape otherwise you do not get function so it's a question of how far you go with your hydrolysate and companies have worked on this and of course they they will give some information away uh, what they call their molecular molecular sieve approach they will give you the kilo daltons of each protein and the, and the pattern and that pattern will be specific to various fish maybe some patterns will work better in other fish than, than others. Okay, so you can bespoke and make a bespoke uh, hydrolyze it to suit the species in question. Okay. Okay. Does that okay. make sense? Yes. That makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Well, Simon, I have a personal question for you. Okay. What okay. will be, from your experience, what do we need to do to reach? middle points between industry standards mm -hmm. and academic research that is being done yes. over the years how can we do that how you see that well i think uh, on the whole i'm very positive of how industry supports research i've been very lucky and fortunate that many of my phd students the majority of them have had generous support and i i could mention them here but i won't today but many of them been very, very high, uh, well regarded and sponsored by major players in the biotechnolo biotechnology sector and the commercial feed formulators and producers, the big names. So they've done very well and many of them are now work for them or gone into other industries relating to um, animal health and uh, fish in particular. So I think we need to have a, a, an agreement on priorities where we can um, work in harmony together and um, but I always uh, industry for me up sometimes asking me for how I got a spare PhD student. Where's your best PhD student? Have they got a job yet? Well, they need to put more funding into this and the funding is um, is good, but it could be better in some cases and a much more alliance with um, state governments and research councils to make some kind of, you know, alliance with them. Um, the industry is is helpful, but doesn't always fully accept the, the, the costs in the universities because our universities are, are, not, are subsidized by government and we need that more money to make that connection. We not, must make our research much more, um, how can I say, uh, practical and being able to put into practice. So I think industry should offer more internships to students to learn about their priorities and have them inside the company for a while during their PhDs. I think that's a good approach too. That's a great answer. Thank you very yeah. much. Okay. Herve, you have more questions, comments? It's another question from Mr. Mohamed Nav Navar. I don't know the pronunciation. Okay. He asked if the insoluble fiber play a role to improve the gut integrity in aquatic animals. 
fiber, fiber, you said. Yeah. Well, the the the, the glycosidic structures I mentioned, the uh, prebiotics, are actually actually classed as fibers. They are really technically they're non-starch polysaccharides. Some of them are in a purified form. Not all of them are purified. They haven't got 100% purity. They are fractions or components of cell walls and everything. Not all of them are going to be 100% pure, but they are fibers in their own way. And we do need fiber in the diets of fish. In fact, my PhD, my own PhD at Sterling was all about fiber. And um, in, the, in the natural world, fish consume a lot of fiber. And animal, animal fiber is chitin. So, you know, uh, trout, salmon, they will be, um, certainly they're equated, equated, uh, equated, I suppose, with fiber in their diet. So we need to look how fiber can be used to modulate gut health and perhaps even add fiber to the diets, functional fiber, okay? Okay, okay. it's another question from Zoltan. Zoltan, he, he yes. Asked, do you agree that many ingredients used in the, in the feed are not natural for fish? So, yes. The, yes. so the gut, uh, let me, let me, because he put two lines. So mm -hmm. the gut is reacting by inflammation. Mm -hmm. So could inflammatory, anti-inflammatory agent would be a yes. solution? Yes, I think uh, it's a good question. And the answer is yes. Um, the chronic, I would call it chronic effect, the chronic, of, chronic effect of plant protein ingredients as, you, as of course, carnivorous fish. A rainbow trout and salmon has never seen a soya bean in his life, but we are using the soya bean meal as a protein source. So in the role of providing amino acids, it should not matter. But the problem is it's not just a pure protein. It's a heterogeneous mixture of other things as well. So the degree of purification, the degree of processing makes a big difference. So the, the, the modern soya beans, the soya protein concentrates obviously are better. But the standard ingredients, and I'm working with people now in the Middle East, in Pakistan, that are using that ingredients locally, uh, such as their local soya bean, which is not of the same quality. They can't afford the imported uh, high pro soy and uh, soy protein concentrate. So that's where we have the problem. And you're right, the, the, the question is right. We are inducing a stress on the gut structure, which you saw in my slides, and it might not it might not kill the fish because the fish lifespan is much shorter. We 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 harvest the fish before it reaches old age, but you know we are not helping the fish in terms of its welfare and the best performance if we have got a chronic uh, inflammation like this. So prebiotics and probiotics can mitigate against this to a great degree, but that's the cure, not the cause. Okay. Was it better we, to have we, a we have another question from Simeon, which is good for. This is good for Jeff Tim. What Simeon. is your point of view of using essential oil and plant extract to modulate right. fish gut microbiota? Right, the essential oils, uh, we can modulate. The, the essential oils now are becoming very interesting in terms of their antimicrobial function in the gut. And uh, there's quite a whole range of them now being looked at in terms of they are known to interact and tone down some of the hyperinflammatory systems and the essential oils um there's a whole range of them from different plants and, and and extracts now but there's some very interesting work on uh essential oils in relation to directly to immunocompetence so i i think there's great potential there to look at these essential oils and of course the organic acids as well that's another big group that should be looked at in much more detail the acidification of the gut is very helpful to a carnivorous species like trout and salmon because the, the, the soya bean meal tends and other ingredients tend to elevate the pH and can cause a pH effect too. So we need to acidify it. It's cleaner and healthier for the gut to have this degree of, of, of uh, maintaining a, a correct pH. Okay, some ingredients shift that pH balance. Okay, um, that's, that's, a, that's a question. To, to evaluate the dietary effect, would you look at the Allo my English is not good. Huh? My <laughs> allotronus or autotropnus microbiome. Yes, yes. Those the latter ones are the ones which we commensal bacteria, which are the ones that um, are anchored to the gut through their fimbriae and lectins, and of course 
they are the ones that um, we need to um, look much more closely at the when we do the gut microbiome and the digester we tend sometimes to neglect the film the microbial film on the surface of the enterocyte because um, microbes form a film in the mucus and it's that when we last did a, a study like this um, in on a farm environment I took I took that layer of the enterocyte. When you open up the gut from that picture I showed you of my dissection of the trout gut, it's it's not enough to just take the digester. We need to take the film. We need to take that surface um, off the cells, and that's very tricky to do. But we need to look much more closely at the at the resident residential bacteria, the commensal bacteria or autochthous bacteria. Okay, okay. Dada is asking. Will soybean protein concentrate help in fish gut? It, will it do? Will it cause damage to the fish gut? Is it that will right? cause damage? Well, not as much as uh, the soy protein concentrates that are available now are of a higher, much higher premium quality. You pay for much more processing, and they are much, much better than they have been. But um, it depends on the sensitivity of the fish. Salmon, salmon are more sensitive to than, than rainbow trout to these the saponin, the saponins and the stachios, raffinos. These are the shorter chain oligosaccharides. These are called oligosaccharides. They're termed non-starch polysaccharides, but they're mainly oligosaccharides, and they can cause the damage. But the saponins are the main problem. The saponins cause the enterocyte to loosen up to cause a cleavage uh, to cause a gap in the um, in the enterocyte uh, uh, layer so you get a gap so you get then infection and breaching the breaching of that gap by bacteria can cause an inflammatory response okay and cause erosion of the of the barrier so that is um, many things come into that quest to answer that question Okay, but some of the soya beans now available are of the highest quality, don't do this as much. But in the salmon, there will always be some evidence. I've I've not seen, and, and one thing I should say, it can heal very, very quickly. It only takes two or three days for the whole of this to recover. Uh, it's a dynamic process. The gut can repair itself very quickly. Uh, one thing I did not mention, is the role of the non um the, the essentially it's not an essential amino acid but it's a conditionally essential amino acid is glutamic acid or glutamate can actually be an amino acid can help gut health okay it's one of those things that i have not listed in my presentation but it's of great interest to us to look at glutamate and glutamine as a part of the gut um cycle of uh, repair okay Okay, yeah, I, uh, on reaction, uh, Roberto Acosta is asking, are all saponin negative for fish and shrimp? Well, that's a good question. I don't think we've, um, we've looked at pure saponins. Um, some experiments where we can buy one of my former uh, students I was linked with um, knows this only too well if he's, if he's watching, but um, we can take saponins and buy them. We were, it was difficult to find the saponins. There's different types of saponins. There's a mm. family of saponins. And we were able to buy the saponins pure from uh, a chemical supply company and add it to the diet to cause damage to the gut in sea bass. These were studies done in sea bass, and we were able to induce induce the enteritis through saponins. How that works in the real world and how it works in different types of raw materials like plant ingredients is much more research to be done. It's a it's good so question, way to answer a question when you don't know. It's good to do more research. <laughs> what, what, one question, but I don't know. I don't know what it is. Can dry okay. azola be substituted to the fresh azola as feed? I don't know what azola what is. is. What is that? Um, I didn't get that. Sorry. Kurt, you know what is azola? Azola, I don't know. I'm sorry. Which, okay. Mm. What is that? So the okay. the next question. Is how you see the future of replacing fish meal by insect meal and no. the effect of the gut health? <laughs> well, I I have okay. I have a love and a hate relationship with I love the idea, the concept of insect meal and invertebrates. Our great friend Albert Tacon, when I was his student, by the way, um, was a was doing a lot of research on invertebrate meals from different organisms, freshwater, marine, everything. 
uh, worms, insects, the lot. And a lot of great work was done in the 1970s, 80s. But the scale is always a problem. It's the, it's the scale. It's how do we get consistency, like the black solia fly, for instance. How do we increase the production of black solia fly to meet their requirements? Now, I know some companies out there do a token gesture. They will put a small amount into the diet and say, we feed our salmon and trout some insect meal or algae meal or whatever. But there's nowhere near enough of it, and it's not consistent. It's got a high fat content, the wrong type of fatty acid profile. Um, it works very well. I've just published a paper with my um, former Nigerian student on the African catfish. It worked very, very well in warm water species like tilapia catfish, but there will be some limitations to uh, salmonids when you consider the fat content. If you defat it or if you take off the chitin, the chitin could be could be beneficial as a fiber. But you know, it, uh, we have to look more closely at how we improve the quality and many 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 companies are producing it on a kind of micro scale backyard city urban level but we need to bring it together to form an industry maybe to coordinate it better like in the fish meal is is brought from all around the world but it's blended and mixed to a right consistency to get the right amino acid profile and all these things and the substrate that the insect meal is fed on will influence greatly its its value so there you go but I like the concept. I like the concept, but the practicalities is another another thing, another challenge. It's like algae. It's like algae. It's very similar. It's scale up and cost. Okay. The, the 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 question of uh, about the azola is uh, so they was asking if if the dry azola could be substituted, uh, if the fresh azola could be substituted by the dry azola. Azola is a fairy moss. It's an aquatic plant. The, okay. Kevin oh. Fitzsimmons told me like a duckweed. Oh, I feel, okay. I, duckweed. I've I've reviewed many many papers in uh, in Asia. They use a lot of duckweed in uh, in polyculture systems when you grow um, fish like carp, for instance, in polyculture and milkfish. Milkfish in Taiwan. There's a lot of interest in these kind of things in ponds in uh, in in bra not brackish so much, but in in, in well low salt water concentrates, but mainly fresh. Yes. There's great potential for fish that can able are able to have the enzymes to digest the cellulose in the duckweed, and um, I, I've seen many good papers where the duckweed is a substitute for uh, pelleted feed, and the pelleted feed then makes up a complement to the duckweed. So the pelleted feed is of a lower specification, and the duckweed is like it's almost like farming ruminants. You have you know your concentrate and your roughage. It's a binary approach to farming fish, which is really works well in, in many countries of the world, especially in the Far East. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of this kind of sustain, sustainability approach using polyculture and duckweed and a closed system of aquaculture. So there's a lot of room for that kind of aquaculture. You know, I've been, my talk has related much more to, to intensive aquaculture because that's exactly. where we see the gut health problems manifest themselves more. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Yes. Well, any other comments, Paul? Paul Hundley, fantastic it, 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 presentation. It, it, by the way, you have very, question. very positive comments, Sammy. Okay. Go on. Okay. One, one, one comment from Kevin Fitzsimmons, the famous oh, uh, Kevin. Dr. Kevin Tilapia, the famous Kevin. Dr. Tilapia. He, he told us that the Azola has a symbiotic, is a cyanobacteria. Mm -hmm. that fixed the uh, nitrogen okay 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 so uh, but the duck we coming back if it uh, the duckweed is obviously i mentioned the duckweed in a different context but there we go okay yes and, and, and one, that's another topic. one last mm -hmm. question of uh, miguel villa yeah. what do you think the use of microalgae oligosaccharides as an immunostimulant what do you think about the use of macroalgae oligosaccharin yes. as a yes. as an immunostimulant, alginate, for example. Well, that, that that's that's very interesting too because um, I've been involved. I haven't published this yet, but we are looking at Scytochytrium. Scytochytrium obviously is being looked at mainly from its omega three, uh, DHA, EPA contribution, and many people have included that in their diets. Not much more than twelve percent. I've never seen. It's not realistic at the moment to think about 
um, Skitakitchum being used at this higher level. Most of these algae are, are used at a cap capped level, maybe 15, 20% in diets for tilapia, um, maybe. They're very expensive. But as a functional feed additive, the cell wall structure of some of these um, algae have some very interesting properties. Some of them contain mannose and galactose are sugar moieties. So they are very similar to what you find in, say, uh, moss, for instance, mananogosaccharides. They share some attributes. So we are seeing some potential use of these algae as inclusion levels are, say, 5% as and selling them as functional feed additives rather than macro ingredients because they're too expensive and they are variable in their uh, composition. But chlorella, there's a desmos, there's uh, many, many of them out there, and uh, Scytokytrium is topical at the moment, but there are many other algae that are being evaluated for uh, functionality, certainly from their carotenoid uh, uh, um, contributions to astaxanthine and carotenoids, zeaxanthine, beta, beta carotene. There's, there are many other areas to be looked at there with algae, okay? And beta carotene is, has some very interesting effects on the immune system because beta carotene can be converted to vitamin A and vitamin A can cross the, the uh, nuclear membrane structure to cause some genomic effects. So we may be able to see some, some genomic interactions here with astaxanthine to improve immune system function. Okay, Simon. So I think there's no no more question yet. So okay. if well, you have more question, maybe we can much. forward to you. Yes, thank you. Well, I just want to thank Jeffo for and Kurt in particular and, and you, Hervey, for arranging this. Obviously, in this hour or so, we can't do everything. I can't do justice to the whole story. There's many, many more avenues I could go down through. I deliberately curtailed the use of, you know, functional, mm -hmm. uh, well, not functional, but raw materials as a substitute to fish meal or soya. I didn't want to go down that route because Dr. Karshik did that very, very well previously. And um, I wanted to look much more at the at this major organ we call the gastrointestinal tract or gut um, as our as our core core interest today, how best to improve that and how that can lead to better, healthier fish and um, and production. And remember welfare. Welfare is very important. We must never underestimate the welfare of our animals. And this is a, a welfare consideration as well. OK, and it's been a pleasure to talk to you from my study here in Plymouth. In fact, the one of the titans of aquaculture was Dr. Halver, Professor John Halver, who he was my office here when he visited me in Plymouth back in 2001. So I, I'd like to say that this is a, a kind of in memory of him as well, okay? To the, the father figure of fish nutrition, as everybody would know. Okay. Excellent. Thank yes. you very much, Simon. Before we leave, I just want to thank everybody again. As for our series of webinar, we will have a little break because of the holidays. And it's been a difficult year and it's important to spend time with the family but coming in uh, next year 2021 we're looking at uh continue with a series of webinars we will involve more latinos and also people from the field who want to go out in the field as the lockdown is is uh, is more is breaking up we will be able to go back on track on the road and probably we will we'll be able to broadcast from a different location so thank you everyone we will send the video we will share the video and the presentation as well um thank you stay uh, healthy and look after yourself like happy new year christmas to everybody happy christmas happy new year thank you very much thank you for thank your time time you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.